Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And uh, in anticipation of our 2015 general election, uh, welcome to these hostings for the Bath constituency. And whatever else we know or don't know, we know we will have a new MP um, post uh, May the whatever it is. Um, uh, my name is Ward Jones. Um, my daytime job is having oversight of the Methodist Church uh, in the west of England. Uh, until fairly recently, I was chair of Somerset Churches Together, which is, I think, why I got the short straw of chairing this evening. Um, my secretary, when he's here, is David Pendle, who is the, uh, the executive secretary of Churches Together in Bath. Um, and it is Churches Together in Bath who have arranged these hostings. Um, that, for those of you who don't know, is a body representing the mainstream Christian denominations in the town and surrounding area. But I want to make it absolutely clear that this is an open meeting, and I want to welcome everyone, whether you are of any faith or none, you are cordially welcome, and I hope you feel part um, of this event. Um, our thanks go to Bath City Church, who have made these premises available to us. Uh, and I'm hugely encouraged, and I'm sure the candidates are too, at the turnout, so thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have a good evening. One or two stage directions, if you like, so that you know where we're going. The candidates already know where we're going. Um, as far as questions are concerned, um, your questions either to all the candidates or initially to a specific candidate should already have been handed in. Uh, if they haven't, it's too late now. Um, and apologies in the sense that um, I'm fairly confident we will not be able to take all the questions um, that have been handed in. Um, but what I promise you is that um, as David um, sorts through the questions that have been handed in either this evening or earlier, um, we will endeavor to ensure that those topics which matter most to you and are most widely represented in the questions we have are the ones that we put to the candidates. Um, most of the time I shall read the question um, on behalf of whoever it is, but from time to time I might uh, invite people to come and put their own question. Um, I want to make it absolutely clear that we're here to listen to the candidates rather than people in the audience, um, uh, uh, and I hope um, you will respect that. Um, each candidate will have a maximum of two minutes to make their response to the questions. You will immediately realize with six candidates we had hoped to have all seven, but for some reason our seventh candidate is not here. Um, um, each candidate will have the opportunity to respond. Um, we do have a clock and a bell, um, and they've been warned about that, and my word is final. Um, before our questions, I will introduce each candidate in turn um, and their party, uh, and they in turn will have two minutes to share with us in whatever way they want to. Um, uh, and. Uh, that will be done in alphabetical order from A down to Z. Um, we'll go through our questions. Um, no later than 9.15, um, I'll invite each candidate to have their last say. They'll have a minute to sum up as they wish, uh, and we'll do that in reverse alphabetical order. My rules. My rules are that it's my discretion as to whether uh, anybody's allowed to continue after the bell is rung. Uh, and uh, whether or not candidates uh, should have the opportunity to respond to the answers that others have given. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to rule fairly tightly because our time is limited. Um, as I say, we'll get to summing up by 9.15 at the latest. Applause and heckling are welcome. So long as the candidates are all allowed to be heard and each view is respected, whether you agree with it or not. So before we begin, a moment, I invite you to share a moment of silence and invite you to use that silence either to pray, to focus, or to simply be quiet as you wish. Thank you very much. So, let the evening begin. Uh, we're going in alphabetical order, so we begin 
on my right, my far right, um, that's no statement about political leanings, um, Liberal Democrats and, uh, and Steve Bradley. Thank you, Ward, and thank you, Church Together, for organizing this evening. Great to see such a, a big attendance here. Apologies. Um, my name is Steve Bradley. I'm the Liberal Democrat candidate hoping to succeed my, my good friend and colleague Don Foster as Bath's next MP. Now, I come from a Christian family. I was, I was raised in faith and schooled in faith before I moved to Bath in 1991. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not these days a practicing Christian. But what I am is a liberal in the truest sense. And that means I will defend to the hilt the rights of others to have their religious beliefs and their rights fully respected at all times. Over the, over the last year, I've seen firsthand the hugely important role faith groups play in the city. I've helped at soup runs, Sunday lunches for the homeless, I've patrolled with the street pastors, supported the food bank, etc., etc. And on all of those occasions, as tonight, I hope that my genuine desire to listen to, to understand, and to engage with those of faith will continue to shine through. Now, nationally, I'm proud of the work the Liberal Democrats have done in government to not only repair Britain's economy, but to do so fairly. And I hope across the evening, I'll get to give some examples of how we've done that. But over the next two hours, I hope to show that I have an understanding of the views and challenges faced by Christians in Bath, nationally, and globally too. And I hope to show that Liberal Democrat values are Christian values as well such as fairness, equality, freedom with responsibility, charity, internationalism, and stewardship of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our second candidate, uh, Julian Deverell of the UK Independence Party. Thank you, Julian. Well, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be back in the forum again. The last time I stood on this stage, obviously we had uh, a rather large UKIP meeting in here, which was a large success. Um, but that, of course, wasn't the first time that I've been in the forum. I used to come to church here as a child, and um, I used to have a little habit of sneaking out of the service. And at one, on one occasion, much to my parents' embarrassment, as I was sneaking out, the preacher um, spotted me and called me by name, and uh, embarrassingly sort of I was led back to my seat. So I do promise that if any of you decide that you get bored this evening, um, I certainly won't call you out in the same way. Um, I'd like some of you to consider what the political class have done for you over the last 10 or 20 years or so, whether it's wage compression, the privatisation of the NHS, or housing shortages. Now, we've got representatives from that failed political class who are here this evening to tell you, if you give them another go, how they're going to fix it for you. So, what I represent is what is now the biggest challenger to the political establishment in 100 years, and we've got a plan. It's a fully costed and a verified manifesto that's going to lower your cost of living. It's going to cut your taxes, restore your democracy, and put an end to fuel poverty and balance the nation's books. So I look forward to getting your questions as the evening progresses. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> Microphone comes to Ben Howlett, who represents the Conservative Party. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be back here again. And it's fantastic to see so many of you here uh, committed to democracy here in Bath for the penultimate uh, hustings of uh, this general election for us. Uh, Britain's churches are at the centre uh, of our communities. And faith groups of all denominations provide support and comfort to millions in our society. As a Christian myself, we should be more confident about our status as a Christian country and more ambitious about expanding the role of faith-based organisations. Christian values of responsibility, hard work, charity, compassion, humility, tolerance and love are shared by people of every faith. We should be confident in standing up to defend them. Over the last five years, and despite the difficult decisions we've had to make, the government has put this values at the heart of its work. 1.9 million more people have the dignity of a job, we have met our international aid targets, and we've outlawed the despicable practice of modern slavery. 
Churches and other faith groups are vital partners. Although we can debate individual policies, we should share in the belief that uh, trying to lift people up rather than to count people out is at the heart of our message. We want to ensure that we deal with our problems in a fair way. The richest are making the largest contribution to reduce the deficit. We've met and will meet our contribution of 0.7% of our national income on aid. And we want to provide support for churches and volunteers, helping to safeguard our churches and cathedrals for the next generation and making it a lot easier uh, for money to be given to charity too. Don Foster has been a fantastic Member of Parliament for Bath over the last 24 years, but we now have an opportunity for change. And over the next few hours, I'd really like to show you the ways that I can help deliver that positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. We change tables and uh, Ollie Middleton and the Labour Party. I firmly believe in the power of politics as a vehicle for positive change, a force for good, but most importantly, a force for hope. And I want to tell you about the positive alternative that Labour can offer those in Bath who have been deeply let down by the two coalition parties. Over the past five years, we've seen a dramatic rise in inequality, an NHS under pressure, and prices rising faster than wages. However, Labour's plan, our vision, is very different. We will protect the poorest and most vulnerable by scrapping cruel and callous policies such as the bedroom tax. We will, we will also tackle low pay by raising the minimum wage to £8 an hour and we will ban exploitative zero-hour contracts. We'll ensure an NHS with time to care by investing £2.5 billion per year every year guaranteeing 20,000 extra nurses and 8,000 extra GPs. We'll also repeal the disastrous Health and Social Care Act and put patients before profit once again. We will invest in our country's future by ensuring each generation does better than the last, by reducing tuition fees to 6,000 pounds and ensuring 80,000 high quality, high skilled apprenticeships. We will reduce the deficit and balance the books by 2020, but we will not make extreme ideological cuts and instead ensure those at the top are paying their fair share and we will tackle low pay. The choice at this election is very clear. Two very different plans, two very different visions, two very different futures. I urge you to choose hope, choose genuine change and choose labour. Thank you very much. Lorraine Morgan Brinkhurst, Independent. Well, thank you very much. It's such a privilege to be your independent candidate for the forthcoming general election. I feel very privileged that I'm a Bath-born candidate. I'm the only Bath-born candidate and have lived in the city all of my life. I have six grown-up children and um, they all went to school here in the city of Bath. But I have an understanding, a great understanding of the city, the city's needs and what the residents and the business community need. I've been a councillor for 20 years and also I've worked in the health service in Bath for 25. I worked at the Royal United Hospital and I've worked in three GP practices in the city. And the last 10 years I've had my own business so I have wide experience as well as sitting on national committees representing residents within the city. The strength in being an independent MP means that I will not have a party telling me how to vote. So I will be able to vote freely in Parliament for policies that are right for Bath. And also, I will have the freedom to, to vote against policies if they're not right for the residents of this city, this wonderful city of Bath, my home city. I have a great faith, I have a very strong faith. I went to the convent in, in the city of Bath throughout my school life. And when I was mayor of Bath in 2002, as the first citizen of the city, I pledged to visit as many churches as I could of all faiths and denominations. To me, that was really important to show support as the first citizen of the city. And I recognize there are many concerns and issues the next government need to address. The NHS, affordable housing, low, low wages, and many, many more issues. And I know that I have the strength and the experience that I can fight for what's right for Bath in Parliament over the next five years. Thank you.
And last night, but not least, representing the Green Party, Dominic Tristram. We're about to uh, all vote, or some of you may already have voted, of course, the postal votes in a very interesting election. In Bath, we see that there's no clear leader. Nationally, there's no clear idea of what the government will be. It's unlikely to be a majority government from any party. So this is an ideal opportunity to actually think very hard about how we're going to vote. I know a lot of you know Don Foster, and he's a nice man, and have voted for him for a long time. But that has to be put into context with what's happened over the last five years. And also, not just the last five years, but since you know, mid-80s, early 90s, where we've seen increasing inequality. And I'm not here to point score against any particular party. I think all governments since the 80s have had a lot to answer for when it comes to the suffering of the poorest in society. And what got me into politics isn't a desire to climb the greasy pole. I mean, nobody, nobody joins the Green Party to, to go, join the, you know, climb that pole to power. We join because we're committed to something. Now, that something can be the environment, which we think has been ignored by the other parties. I mean, they, they talk the talk, but they don't really do much about it. They all support fracking, for example. You know, we're there saying, actually, stewardship of this earth, whether you're religious or not, is actually a fundamental thing for not just us and our well-being, but our children's well-being. I've got a couple of children. I want to leave a world that's good enough for them to live in. And what do I see? I see, you know, the world is just getting generally, not just fracking, I mean, it's all sorts of things. We've got millions of people queuing at food banks. We've got millionaires having tax breaks. And what for? You know, for this five-year electoral cycle, which is just for the people to have these careers, it's not good enough. We've got a long-term vision for this country and the world. Our long-term vision is that it has to be a sustainable society that we live in. We have to treat the poorest in society well. It's outrageous what's happening, the privatizing the NHS and fracking everywhere and people, you know, people's wealth inequality going up and up. We've got billionaires in London while there's people queuing for food, as I say. Something has to be done about it. I plead with you to vote with your heart, look at manifestos, see who actually cares about society and isn't just caring for the people who are funding them. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we now know that the bell works. Um, thank you, everybody. We, we, we almost cracked it there. We've set a huge standard. Six, five out of six have learned what two minutes is all about. So uh, uh, you've set your own challenge, guys. Um, we've got a number of issues uh, in the field of environment. Surprise, surprise. Um, I'm going to start with a question. I'm terribly sorry. I can't quite read the writing. It would be Aliona Quillery. Have I got it sort of right? Thank you. Um, and, and, and her question is, uh, uh, how do you intend to improve and encourage sustainable living in Bath? Uh, we'll, we'll start in a moment um, with Ollie, and I'm going to try and roll the questions around so that everybody gets a chance to go first. Uh, I know they're probably bursting already after listening to one another as to things they would have liked to come back on, but this is where it gets going tough. How do you intend to improve and encourage sustainable living in Bath? Ollie Middleton. Well, uh, thanks for the question, Aliona. I mean, um, having grown up in Bath, I'm very clear that the single biggest issue um, we face in the city um, is transport. I grew up battling our failing transport system. Um, the, uh, the, as a, the, the problem, as far as I see it, involves um, two issues. One, lack of affordability, and two, inefficiency. It's very much a local problem, but it's a local problem that requires a national solution. I'm really pleased that Labour do have that national solution. and um, We'll integrate transport and hand the power to control fares back to councils. That way we can begin to get more people out of their cars into buses, reducing congestion, reducing air pollution and improving air quality um, in the city. Um, with regards to um, sustainable living and our, our commitments to the environment, um, we've set a national decarbonisation target of 2030. We want to continue um, investment in renewables and create one million green jobs by 2025. Uh, I think it's really important that we're doing all we can as a city, through schools, through local community um, organizations, um, to encourage sustainable living, and making sure that everyone sees the importance of living sustainably and maintaining our commitments to the environment. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Julian, would you like to come in on that one, please? Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about, thank you, um, our energy policy. We take a bit of a different approach. Um, we acknowledge that a lot, of the, um, a lot of the changes that we've made to the way that we deal with energy in this country haven't been hugely successful for the people of this country. We've seen very, very high um, energy prices. And I speak to a lot of people who are suffering financial hardship as a result of this. We have people who are struggling to pay their gas bills um, because they're so high. And obviously the cliched phrase you hear is choosing between heating and eating. Um, we don't agree with the concept of carbon targets. We would set up a much more diverse energy market that encompasses, you know, that encompasses coal, solar, um, fracking, um, you know, various, various sources of energy so that we do have um, good, cheap supplies of energy. We are, at the moment, very, very... We've never been closer, in fact, to running out of energy. Um, last year, we had to pay um, large production companies to turn off production in order to prevent blackouts. That was something that they were planning to do this year, but they brought it forward. Um, so to say that the energy policies and, and, and the energy initiatives have worked um, definitely isn't, uh, isn't the case. And if you are um, concerned with CO2 output, one of the things that this energy policy has done is simply force, force it abroad. You know, people will take the, um, the industry to countries where there are virtually no regulations and just move it over there. So I think we have to get you know, more realistic about it and start looking at ways that energy will serve us rather than, uh, rather than targets. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, would you like to, to give us a reflection, please? Yes, thank you. Um, well, this covers a very large area and lots of issues within the city, but I'll just sort of touch on a few. Um, people really deserve to be able to live and have the quality of life that they deserve. And in the city of Bath, because we have high pollution levels, research has shown that various areas across the city, there are a lot of children who are suffering from asthma. And so one of the big areas is to, to sort out the transport. It needs to be sorted out. The bus companies have monopolies, and so that needs to be dealt with because the bus prices are expensive. So we need to get more people onto the buses and less cars into the city centre. We also need to encourage people to shop locally. Bath had the first ever farmer's market in the whole of the country, and that is really fantastic. So we need to encourage people to shop locally because also if you think of all the goods that are coming into the city that are being driven from miles away so that's really important as well and also we need to sort out um, with pollution we need to sort out particularly the London Road area and the east of Bath park and ride or park and rail we need the next government to fund this we need the city deserves better than it's getting and we need that sorted in the next government so there's so much so many interlinked issues um, that I could go on for hours, and I know I'm not allowed to, but there are so many issues. But it's about getting a quality of life that our residents in this city deserve. It's a quality of life through better earnings, uh, better food. Um, half the people across the country who use the, use the food banks, these people are in employment. They're not all on welfare. These people are earning low wages, so their quality of life is not good. And so that has to be addressed by the next government. And if the next government address it, then this will be for the better and for the good of the people of the city of Bath. Lorraine, you can, keep, you can try keep going on for hours about it, but you may not get too far. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a brute. Uh, we're doing very well. Let's, let's stay on this table. Dominic, and just a reminder for those of you sitting out there, in case, how do you intend to improve and encourage sustainable living in Bath? Transport, as everyone has said, is obviously an important issue to almost everyone here. And again, buses, which everyone will talk about, are an important issue. One thing that's not often talked about is it's fine to some extent if you live in Bath, but lots of towns and villages around Bath have a really appalling bus service. And so it's fine for us to say um, people should use cars, as we do as a party. But of course, you can't say that until you actually improve the bus service. Now, I don't believe a bus service that operates on the basis of the maximum profit it can make is a particularly sustainable way of having a coherent transport policy. 
you know, I, I'd like to see the council running bus services again. The deregulation of bus services that happened well, from the 80s onwards have been terrible for this country when it comes to st strategic transport and cutting pollution. So let's tackle that. Let's admit that that's failed, that privatisation of buses has failed, and think about something more strategic. Um, another issue in Bath, of course, is it's lovely, lots of lovely old houses, but actually some of them are fairly, very, very badly insulated. And so, sometimes that's because people can't afford insulation, which is why we would run out, roll out an insulation program for people who cannot, can't afford it. But also some are listed buildings, and there's really bizarre rules in this country about what you can do to a listed building when it comes to insulation. I would say, let's insulate those buildings. As long as it doesn't actually permanently alter the structure of the building, let's just do it, because it's ridiculous that people aren't, to put, aren't allowed to put double glazing in, and they're paying God knows how much for, for heating, when actually they could just put some double glazing in, and nobody can even tell the difference the, from the road. And finally, I want to talk about schools. It's important that all kids can walk or cycle to school. We've got to think about, as a city, the fact that people drive all the way across, you know, some people who live next to a school might drive across the city to, to, to another school. So let's get safe walking and cycling routes to schools and change our policy for education so actually people do go to their nearest school wherever it's possible. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> ben, let's hear a Conservative view, please. There's a local answer to this and there's a national answer to this question. At a local level, yes, everyone here is going to be talking about uh, resolving our transport woes in Bath. And yesterday I brought the uh, Environment Secretary of State to the London Road to see for herself the uh, high air pollution levels we've got in Bath and also to look at ways of introducing things like a low emission zone, which has worked very successfully in Oxford and also in Brighton as well. And there needs to be a standardisation across the whole of the UK on that particular policy. Our transport manifesto, you can see it on my website, benforbath.co.uk forward slash transport. Uh, it's fully uh, deliverable. Uh, it introduces ideas like an Oyster card, smart card ticketing on buses to make sure we end up driving down costs on buses because they are prohibitively high. And families, to be frank, uh, shouldn't have to faff around trying to find change to get on the buses. They should have something that's more easily accessible. Uh, creating more segregated cycle paths, that's a very important part. And also for those people who live at the top of the hills, uh, why don't we look at the idea of having more cycle racks on buses to get people's bikes back up the top of the hill, um, save their legs. Uh, I'm not Bradley Wiggins, but uh, you know it might be helpful. Um, in addition to that, at the national level, there are two things very importantly we need to be looking at. Um, first of all, it's about creating a competitive uh, food sector in this country. And this, co uh, this government has invested very heavily, £160 million pounds into something called the agri-tech sector uh, strategy, which is about improving productivity on our farms uh, around the rest of the UK, and we've seen some very good early developments on that. But to be honest with you, we must and absolutely have to reform our common agricultural policy at a European level. We've got a disgusting situation where there's huge amounts of overproduction across the whole of the European Union, which is being subsidised, and that is causing huge amounts of problems here and around the rest of the world as well. And and we need to make sure that we're changing that and reforming that. And I hope if we are able to, with a re renegotiation package, we'll be able to reform that going forward. Oh, we had a bell. <laughs> and last but least, uh, Liberal Derek View and Steve Bradley, please. Thank you, Ward. Um, firstly, I, mean, I genuinely believe the biggest challenge society, humanity faces isn't terrorism, isn't the economy, isn't immigration. I passionately believe it's climate change. I'm a lifelong environmentalist. I've been active on environmental issues way longer than I've been active in politics. And I think the role of an MP is about civic leadership. So in this issue, I think we need to start with a very clear target. I've said throughout this campaign, I want to help make Bath Britain's greenest city. How do we do that? Well, I believe I'm the only candidate with, with the best experience to do it. I run my own business as a consultant on sustainability. I advise architects, developers, builders on how to green new communities. It's what I do for a living. So in terms of what should we do here in Bath, well, we've all talked about transport, and I'm really proud to say that after years of neglect, the Liberal Democrat-run council, since we took control in 2011, this city now has its first transport strategy in 50 years, signed up to by all political parties on this council. So we have a clear plan for the first time in 50 years for how to tackle transport in this city, and the job of an MP will be crucial to go out and get the funding to meet the ambitious but deliverable schemes in there to tackle our transport. But it's not just about transport, it's about food, where our food comes from. And this council has brought in one of only three food strategies in councils across the UK, looking at cutting down food miles and the health uh, and other issues around food. On energy, 
The Liberal Democrat Ron Council has worked with a community co-op, Bath and West Community Energy, an award-winning organisation. We've made great strides in having micro-generation in the city. I want us to go much, much further. And at a national level, the Liberal Democrats have been very clear. In the first two years of any Liberal Democrat involvement in government moving forwards, we would bring in five green laws to permanently, permanently make Britain greener, to retrofit our homes, a nature act to protect our nature and wildlife, a zero waste act to create a circular economy where we no longer dump stuff, a zero carbon act to clean up our energy, and a green transport act to not only clean up our transport to stop, but to stop hardwiring in dependence on the cars in the future. So let's start with the clear target of making this Britain's greenest city. Thank you. Now I invite somebody to keep a record of who gets the most bells rung, and uh, we'll report that back to you at the end of the evening. <laughs> you said that, not me. Um, we'll, uh, we'll move into a completely different area now. I wonder if Jane Allen would come and ask her question on Palestine, please. Jane, do you have, your, do you have a copy of the question yourself? It's coming to you. Yeah, hi. The Palestinian Authority has openly stated that if they get statehood in the West Bank, it will be an Islamic state comparable to Iran. A recent report published by a Palestinian stated that the majority of West Bank Palestinians who are not part of Fatah or Hamas, fear for their lives if Israel leaves. Moderate and Christian Palestinians have asked that we in the West establish alternative and democratic Palestinian leadership before declaring a state of Palestine. What will you do to meet these requests and ensure the safety of Palestinians living in the West Bank? And if I could have the paper back, that would be a tremendous help. <laughs> I'm just going to read the question through because it's a pretty challenging question. And, and uh, um, the Palestinian Authority has openly stated that if they get statehood in the West Bank, it will be an Islamic state comparable to Iran. That's a statement about what they plan to do. A recent report published by a Palestinian stated that the majority of West Bank Palestinians who are not part of Fatah or Hamas fear for their lives if Israel leaves. Moderate and Christian Palestinians have asked that we in the West establish alternative and democratic Palestinian leadership before declaring a state of Palestine. So in this maelstrom of possibilities, what will you do to meet these requests and ensure the safety of Palestinians? I presume that means all Palestinians um, living in the West Bank. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with Dominic, please, if, if you would, for the Green Party. You've got your first question out of the way, then. Yeah. Um, our party policy on uh, Israel and Palestine is quite clear. We, we really want the um, judgment of the UN to be abided by, the, um, and Israel to retreat to its uh, 1967 borders. And the, um, you know, it's, it's all well known what, what uh, the UN resolutions are and the, the fact that they haven't happened um, has led to a lot of problems, let's just say. That's just key. You know, a lot of problems. Now, I, have, I must say I haven't heard this. I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to accept that it has been said. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I, it's not true. Um, I am really wary about us as the West installing what we think is a good government in any country because a lot of the times we've done that it hasn't ended up very well. Um, I, I think, I mean, there, there are all sorts of problems. I mean, you know, I, of course it's a very difficult issue, but I don't think we're going to improve things by, get, by getting involved again. I think, I think the thing to do is, as much as possible, have UN peacekeeping in. Let's, let's imagine this world where there is an independent Palestinian state that's granted you know, uh, you know, it's, itself as, a, as an independent state. Um, I think I'd like to see the UN in there for a while to make sure it's all fine, as much as possible. But it, things are going to go wrong in some ways and some things are going to go right. And I think we've got to leave it to people to make their own destiny to a certain extent. We do what we can to avoid atrocities, obviously. But to go in and say, you must have this structure because we think that's best, is just going to, you know, it's going to inflame things, I, th I think. 
Uh, that's my theory anyway. And, um, you know, um, that's my answer, really. I think we just leave them to it. It's a, you know, they're, they're a nation. They can make their own choices. Let's hope they do make the right choices, and let's make sure that we've got the backup if they do need, to, need us to come in and stop anything really bad happening. Thank you. Ben Howlett, Ben, please. Largely, actually, I agree with Dominic on that view. And Jane, I've got an awful lot of respect for you on this particular uh, issue. Uh, the concern that I have is that, yes, OK, every Western nation wants to try and pursue a two-state solution. Uh, that's not going to change. But uh, my concern is that Hamas are biding their time very wisely, in, in, in my mind, uh, until the time comes that the West grants the Palestinian states uh, full statehood, and then we will see uh, effectively what you ended up saying there, which is a, uh, a an Islamic state and the persecution of Christians, persecution of all uh, different uh, minorities within uh, Palestine, and I'm very, very concerned by that. Uh, the government's position is quite clear. It does want to work towards a two-state solution and that they're looking at uh, taking international leadership on this, and uh, I, I feel, to be honest with this is off the cards at the moment until we see a new um, change in the President of the United States because as it stands we haven't really been talking about the Israel-Palestinian issue uh, whilst Obama has been the President of the United States. I can't really see that changing until whoever becomes the next uh, President of the United States. The UK government will continue to work on uh, the peace process in uh, the uh, West Bank and making sure that uh, we are uh, still delivering humanitarian aid to the the uh, Palestinian government, and we committed a further 20.7 million at the Cairo Agreement back in the autumn uh, last year. Um, but we've got to accept, uh, as a party ourselves, as the Conservative Party, that Israel has built um, illegally into Palestinian territory, and that will not stop us from, uh, well, it will not stop me from saying that if I became the MP here, and I'd be happy to have that debate with residents uh, across the floor uh, if and when the uh, time comes on the House of Commons, uh, when it comes up at the House of Commons. Thank you, Ben. Come back over here, Lorraine, please. Well, I, I felt Dominic answered it extremely well and, and also being the, the first one of the candidates to actually answer. I think rather than intervene with a directive, I agree that we need to work with other countries um, with peacekeeping forces that's so vital. But we, we owe the people of Palestine, we owe them our fellow human beings, that they, we owe them safety. We do owe that to them, as we would hope other countries would support us if we were in similar situations. And an example of, of something that I've been involved in, in 2001, I was one of 187 British people um, chosen to go to Kosovo, and it was their first elections after that terrible war between the Serbs and the Albanian Kosovans. And we took what I thought was a fair democratic election to that country. And people actually welcomed us. They welcomed us being there. They welcomed, they wanted peace. And I feel that there are times where we can support our, our, our fellow human beings who are going through very difficult times in various ways and peacekeeping is one of the ways because I think of the support that they had at that time from K4, from military forces from across the world who were just there as peacekeepers to support them and to support the rifts that were still sort of rumbling through Kosovo. So I agree with the other candidates that rather than us go in and make a directive on how how their country should be run, what should happen, that it's about peacekeeping, but it's there to support, support our human beings at the, at the difficult times that they face. Thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> we'll keep bouncing about. On the other end, Steve, please. Liberal Democrat view. Thank you, Ward. I mean, Israel-Palestine is undoubtedly one of the most important international issues, and I've been to the Holy Land myself um, to see the situation there for myself. I did one dedicated trip around Israel, and I did a second one a few years later around Palestine and some of the refugee camps in Jordan. And that taught me three things, really. Firstly, we really have to progress with the UN-mandated two-state solution. Now, I'll be honest with you, I wish we could have a one-state solution in Israel-Palestine. 
I wish we could have Palestinians, Arabs and Israelis living together in peace. We didn't accept a two-state solution in South Africa. We didn't select, accept a two-state solution in Northern Ireland. And we're not accepting a two-state solution in Cyprus. So it pains me that we have to progress to a two-state solution in Israel. But I, I think things have gone so far that no other option, unfortunately, is likely to work. Secondly, to echo what's been said previously, it's really not our job in the West to charge into the Middle East and install a type of government that we think is right. I mean, we, we, we tried that before, didn't we? And we're still paying the price in Iraq and places like that now for the mistakes we made back in 2003, which was the event that actually got me into politics in the first place. Uh, finally, we need to encourage and enable peaceful government, peace, freedom, civil liberty in that area. We need to ensure that repression of Palestinians and the Palestinian state ends, but we also need to ensure that Israelis can live without fear of attack. And my absolute final point of why this is so important, I mean, the Israel-Palestine, I believe, is the cornerstone of a lot of the current global conflict we see. It's the great unresolved running sore in international relations. And for as long as we have that situation unresolved, it is just too damn easy to radicalize young Islamic men in this country and elsewhere by saying, look, there's your proof that the West treats Muslims differently than it treats everybody else. It's just too easy. Let's solve the problem in Israel and Palestine, ensuring dignity for both communities there. And then I really believe we can reduce the international conflict we have, conflict situations which enables Christians to come under attack. Thank you. Ollie Middleton and a Labour view, please. Yeah, with regards to the uh, specific report that you mentioned, uh, Jane, I wouldn't really feel comfortable commenting until I've actually read it myself. Um, but what I will say is that the Labour Party um, is in favour of working towards a two-state solution. Um, that's why I'm proud um, that last year we put forward a motion in the House of Commons to recognise the state of Palestine officially. Um, that motion was passed. Um, we cannot have a two-state solution until we actually recognize um, Palestine as a state legally. Um, so, you know, let's work with the UN, let's work with the wider region, let's work with the two um, countries in question, and, and let's hopefully try and achieve a, a peaceful solution for all. And again, last but not least, Julian uh, Deverell and the UK Independence Party. Well, even though I'm the one to go last, it still doesn't make answering this question any easier. And obviously, if there was an easy answer, we probably wouldn't be uh, talking about it this evening. Yeah. Um, now, I met with a Palestinian, um, it was a few months ago, and uh, she had um, had to flee a Palestine. She was a, um, she was a Christian, and she spent a lot of time um, telling me about the way that she was persecuted over there um, by other Palestinians. And um, I often find it quite interesting when we see um, you know, people on the political spectrum um, lending their support to one particular side. And I find it very, very difficult to comprehend that. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't um, ever stick a, you know, a badge for either side um, on my lapel. Um, in the UKIP manifesto, we do, it is written that we do support a two-state solution. Um, I think that we need to look at the situation of Christians in that region that are being persecuted. That's definitely going on, um, and we're not hearing a huge amount about it in the media. And I think that part of the reason that this is so difficult is that we're not given um, the full story in our, in our mainstream media, as we're not with a lot of things. Um, but the other thing that alarms me is I hear stuff about boycotting. You know, we hear people saying, let's boycott goods from Israel and services and all sorts of things like that. And I find that astonishing because it's um, certainly not something I would agree with. When you, when you bring about those boycotts, you're hurting the people in, in those um, regions, irrespective of what nationality or religion they are, and you're damaging them economically. Um, and I find that, um, I, I don't agree with that either. But. Thank you.
Uh, if you were sat up here alongside me, you'd realise that there's no possibility of actually getting through all the questions. We could spend the whole evening on environment, on foreign policy or whatever. So I want to say at this stage, thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Um, and as I say, we're trying to keep some shape as to where we're going. Uh, because this is an, org uh, an event organised by uh, Christians in Bath, I want to uh, uh, invite Peter Hayward to come and put a question now, um, which... Um, hang on a minute. This is about Christian values. Peter, please. Thank you very much. Um, for centuries, Christianity has provided a framework in this country to bring cohesion and provide common values for the good of all. But now that foundation is being challenged. What are the values that you will hold if you are elected, and would you define them as Christian, or do you think that Christian values are a thing of the past? For centuries, Christianity has provided a framework in this country to bring cohesion and provide common values for the good of all. That's where we've been over centuries. But now that foundation is being challenged, we all read the headlines. What are the values that you will hold if you are elected? Would you define them as Christian, or do you think that Christian values are a thing of the past? And uh, Lorraine, I've got you down to go first. Okay, thank you. Well, um, as I said in my opening statement, um, I have a very strong faith. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic, um, but I respect everyone of all faiths, and I believe that that is vital. I don't believe that Christian values are a thing of the past. I really don't. I think there is so much strength within the Christian community that we can all work together for the good of our communities and for our people. We have had we've started to see the terrible atrocities that are happen happening with ISIS and what's happening through social media and how our young people are, are being coerced into different values, values, some of them values that were never there with their families. And we've got to address that, and I believe that the next government have got to address that. They've got to put more money into national security to support um, not only our country, but I fear for some of our young people, those young people that have, have already traveled abroad, those young people that have not been saved from traveling abroad. And I believe that as strength, as a, as a community, a Christian community, that we will and always will overcome this. But more has to be done by our governments to support us. We can't do that alone as a Christian community and all the faiths coming together. We have to, we have, to have the support of the governments, not just our government, but the governments across the world to stop some of these terrible atrocities that are happening. They say it's in their, all these atrocities are in line with their faiths and their beliefs. That is not true. And we have to deal with that. And we have to deal with that through our national security and our investment. Because those young people that already traveled abroad, they are our future. They are definitely our future. And we have to now protect the young people and, all, and stick together as a Christian community. We will overcome this. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm perfectly happy to allow people to say what they want to say or don't say, and you can decide what you think about what they say in answer to any particular question. Okay, let's, uh, let's then turn to, the, uh, to Steve Bradley and the Liberal Democrat view, please, Steve. Thank you, Ward. Um, firstly, I genuinely believe there is such a thing as Christian values. You don't need me to tell you that. Um, but I also believe in, in many ways they're, they're universal values. Um, I mean, let's not forget that the, the seed of Christianity, the Old Testament, was also the seed of, of all Abrahamic faiths, as well as Christianity. Um, and I believe that sort of started to set the scene for what Christians believe in. I mean, it's not my place to tell you that. You, you know this stuff yourself. So second point I would make is 
I think, I don't believe you have to be a Christian to share what I call Christian values. I think it probably helps, if I'm quite honest with you. Um, but I don't believe you have to be a Christian to share in some of those values. And I'll explain to you the beliefs that I would have if I'm fortunate enough in two weeks' time to be elected as your MP. The beliefs that I hold absolutely dear are fairness, equality, freedom of belief, freedom of expression, respect for others, stewardship of our planet. And I mean, I could go on, but I hope you see that those are values which I'm sure everybody here would also subscribe to. Um, I don't necessarily label them as Christian values, but I understand they are values which are echoed very strongly within the Christian community. So in summary, yes, I believe there are Christian values. I think they're fantastic values. I think they're the kind of values that this and any other country should have. I believe it's utterly important that in our families, that, families, that young people are given a moral compass of values like that. I don't believe you can only get them through being a Christian, those values. I suspect it probably helps said, but I don't believe you can only get them through that way. And I've outlined what I believe myself would be the guiding values for my political judgment if I'm fortunate enough to be elected your MP in two weeks' time. Holly Middleton, Labour Party, please. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to recognise the fantastic work that Christians do individually and Christian organisations do across the world. Some of our, our biggest global charities um, were founded by Christians and they continue to do brilliant work um, right across the world. I've been to Africa, I've seen some of the work um, in action myself. Now my values are, are, are very clear, um, equality, fairness, inclusivity, those are also Labour Party values. I'm not religious myself, my values are not born out of any faith, um, they're born out of my experiences. Um, I agree with Steve in, in terms of what he said that lots of those values are, are actually universal. I think it's really important that those individuals that do sh sh um, share the same values work in synergy to achieve a more cohesive and more equal society. Julian Deverell, please. Well, I think um, we're one of the only parties who will come out many, many times and acknowledge that Britain is a, um, is a Christian country. And um, our values are part of our culture. And, you know, we acknowledge that Britain has got an absolutely fantastic culture and we don't um, make apologies for celebrating that and uh, I think unfortunately some people have we've reached a stage in our in our political sort of development where some people seem to think that celebrating that culture um, is somehow wrong but um, you know that some of the values that I'm talking about are things like tolerance fairness acceptance kindness and decency and a sense of fair play and it's these Christian values that in the very beginning they sort of underpinned the fundamentals of our legal system and much of our legal system has been built upon those and um, and I think that you know one of the things that we're very keen to, prom to promote is the idea that we can have a common set of values and that we can have a legal system that um, that everybody is equal under so nobody's treated differently in the eyes of the law um, so that the rule of law is applicable equally to everybody um, and I think that we do see um, some other cultural practices going on in this country um, that we don't find acceptable. And often people don't like to talk about them. And we've seen some members of the political class sweep them under the carpet. We'll face them head on and we'll ensure that, um, that our values are upheld and that our legal system um, treats everyone fairly. Going to the other side of the table, Dominic, would you like to share with us, please? Um, I think it, we have to recognize that one of the uh, victories, and this isn't a bad thing, of, of Christianity in this country is that we, you know, people have said our common values are Christian values. Well, that's because, really, that's come from Christianity, and we should accept that. I mean, it's a good thing 
that actually common values, you don't have to be Christian necessarily to share Christian values because that's just become the accepted way that we live our lives and we should celebrate that. Um, I, my background, I went to uh, religious schools, Catholic schools. My senior school was run by an order of brothers and uh, one thing that um, impressed me about them was their absolute dedication to their faith and the fact that they would give all their money to charity and they actually absolutely lived the life. And one thing that slightly concerns me, out, concerns me about this is that Christian values could mean almost anything. There are so many sects and so many denominations that they're all the core things that everyone ag agrees with, and I think they are the ones we can all agree with. And, and then you get things like when, um, and I know this isn't going to be popular with some people, but the Equal Marriage Bill. Um, I think in some ways it's, it's good that the state has said, okay, we accept your Christian values, we accept your views, but actually there are a lot of people who don't share that faith, and we think equality is important. And those people should... Um, so I think we, but Christians shouldn't be disappointed by that because actually, you know, you should celebrate the fact that you, you, you want fairness. Well, I mean, let's, let's leave that for now. I mean, I, what, another thing I want to say, though, is um, I have a lot of time for people who are genuinely religious. I, what I don't have a lot of time for is for some politicians who will talk about Christian values and then actually celebrate the fact that migrants, for example, are detained in camps for six months and children don't have enough food to eat or people are sinking the Mediterranean. You know, we have to recognize that actually, yes, Christianity, very good. People who proclaim Christianity but aren't Christian by any measure, we should call them up on it. So let's not just use this as a blanket of praise because really, yes, a lot of time for that faith, but let's make sure that those people actually do profess the faith they claim to have. Spot on the bell. Last but not least, Ben Howlett from the Conservative Party. Well, as I said in my opening statement, I think we should be a lot more proud about saying that we're a Christian country and that we're proud to hold Christian values as well. Um, like Lorraine, I'm a Christian, Church of England, uh, rather than Roman Catholic, but we share uh, a common goal, which is to promote things like responsibility and hard work and charity and humility and tolerance. And these are values which I hold dear to my heart. That might come up later on. One of the things that I'm passionate about is making sure that I break down typical stereotypes that exist. When I go out and door knock and explain to people, look, I'm a young person and I'm also a Christian, they raise an eyebrow and say, hold on, that's strange. So it's great to see an audience today which has got a huge number of young people here who uh, might share the same sort of faith as me and we should be loud and proud about that as well. And it's lovely to see the Prime Minister take that sort of um, standing up for faith in public life approach rather than, you know, number 10 doesn't do God. Well, actually, uh, the Prime Minister constantly says at Christmas and at Easter that he's a Christian and he's wanting to promote these values. And we've been enshrining this into law over the last five years too. And there are some amazing charities in Bath that are doing exactly the same thing on a day-to-day -day basis, often under-recognised at the Trauma Recovery Centre, um, backing, backed by uh, Christians. You've got the Genesis Trust, which is doing fantastic things on a day-to-day -day basis. Without uh, hard-working Christians in Bath, there would be an awful lot more people who are facing a much bigger struggle. And, you know, if I do become the MP, I did want to make sure that I am standing up for those people and saying thank you so much for the hard work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So shout loud and proud is my message. Thank you all six of you. We're going to go into a very Bath-specific question now and uh, I'm going to give you one minute each to answer this one. Um, I'll read it out twice so that whoever gets the first shot has a little bit of breathing space. It's a question by Guy Gardner about the police station closure in Bath. We know Bath police haven't got guns. Now they haven't got a police station. How do the candidates feel? We know Bath police haven't got guns. Now they haven't got a police station. How do the candidates feel? And uh, I thought for this one we'd begin with Ben. To be honest with you, I'm absolutely astonished that the uh, police have uh, disregarded about four or five attempts for a meeting with them to discuss this very issue over the last few months. Uh, it's a concern to residents across Bath that you can't have, and I use this analogy, uh, a castle without a keep. It's not just about the fact there isn't a facility in Bath for them to put down their vests, to station their police cars, and to uh, have residents be able to walk in uh, and report across 
crime is about the fear of crime and the fear of safety on a day-to-day -day basis in Bath. I was given an assurance by the former uh, Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset Police before he ended up having to um, take a sabbatical, um, and he said that there would be a fully operational police station somewhere else in Bath. Now, I have had a refusal of a succession of meetings with the uh, current area superintendent of Bath, and I find that astonishing. Uh, it's so astonishing, I brought it up with the Home Secretary, and she's looking into that too. Thank you. Listen, listen to the answers and make your decisions. I want to hear from the candidates. No, 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 no. Uh, we're going to, uh, to Ollie Middleton and Labour, please. Um, I, I do, in part, certainly agree with what the gentleman just said. Um, the policing budget has been cut dramatically by the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats in government. Ultimately, this is one of the reasons why we're losing um, the police station in Bath. Um, Bath and, um, and, and Avon Somerset Police are being forced to make huge savings. Um, I, I say that that's part of the reason because there are also issues with regards to the building and whether or not it's necessarily fit for purpose going forward. Um, we also highlighted this issue as a local party. Like Ben, we were giving um, assurances that there would be still a fully operational police station in Bath. Um, it's something I've been asked to be kept up to date with. Um, I think we're very much going to have to wait and see on that one. Um, however, I also agree with what Ben said in terms of, um, of, of big safety issues. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people who feel very uncomfortable about the prospect of being without um, a police station in Bath. It's a city that's visited by thousands of tourists every year. Um, it, it's vital that we have an operational police station here in the city. Thank you. <coughs> Julian Deverell and UKIP, please. Oh, sorry, it's working. It is astonishing, isn't it, that um, a city like Bath is going to lose its police station. Um, we do hear a lot about government cuts. They seem to be cutting in all sorts of areas, um, often with um, you know, often essential services, things that we really, really need. And I think we probably do need um, a police station. There's no doubt about that. We're committed to increasing the number of police. Um, UKIP have made a commitment to 6,000 new personnel for the police, prison and border force. Um, and uh, I think that one of the key things for me on this is, is governments prioritising their spending. You know, we see billions wasted on vanity projects such as HS2, for example, and then we're cutting really, really essential things. Um, and I think that some just common sense prioritisation of how we spend our money so that society has, a, you know, at the very least, it's the essentials, which a functioning police force without doubt definitely is. Has got, a, has got to form part of the government's um, policy. Thank you. Dominic Tristan, please. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sure everyone on the panel will agree that Bath needs a police station. I mean, it's not controversial, is it, to think a city should have a police station. Um, obviously, these are the results of cuts. I mean, it's ob yeah, that's ev obvious in itself. Um, if instead, if the government had you know, cut the ridiculous police and crime commissioner elections that nobody really wanted, then they might have been able to save Bath Police Station. Um, it's just a, a, one part of the messing up of almost everything they're doing. I mean, I used to work for the National Police in, uh, Improvement Agency, which is an agency in London, which was disbanded by this government, and everyone was made redundant and re-employed as contractors. I mean, it's, the, the amount of faffing about, which all that money could have gone to the front line, but there's this ideological zeal to just change everything. And in the end, it means that you, miss, you lose your police station. So, you know, that's austerity for you. And a Liberal Democrat view from Steve Bradley. Thank you, Ward. Um, firstly, absolutely echo it is the wrong decision for Bath. Um, unlike the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats and myself, we have spoken with the police about this. The background is, they had a property deal in Bristol for police station, but they dithered on 
and the deal collapsed. They felt they had their fingers burnt. As soon as the university in Bath came in with a good offer, they snapped it up with no plans for what else to do. So it's unacceptable. Um, the police try and say, oh, but the greatest amount of calls we get in Bath are in the southwest. Therefore, we'll have a physical operational base for our vehicles there. But I don't think that's acceptable. Um, luckily, the Liberal Democrat Council is helping to fill the breach. We've offered the police, and I believe they're taking it, space in the one-stop shop opposite. So they can have a physical presence, but it's still not good enough. But finally, this is a bit of a window into the future. The Conservatives have been very clear. If they're running the government next time, they will pursue an agenda of £50 billion worth of cuts from the public sector. That's eight times what we currently spend on the police. This is a window into what will happen if we have a Conservative government back in pursuing 100% cuts. Lorraine, you'll have worked out it's your turn next. Thank you. Um, we need Bath Police Station presence. We need to have a station still here in the city of Bath. Over the years, we've seen the coalition government, the previous governments, the cutbacks. We don't see the police on the beat like we used to in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And it was always quite a good deterrent, um, knowing that, to, that the police were out there, that we felt safe. And we don't see any of that now. And I can give you an example in more recent times when, as a lot of people know, I live in Newbridge. I've lived in Newbridge uh, for 38 years now. And I phoned the police. It was out of hours because the shop next door to me was being burgled. And they said to me, Newbridge Road where? And I'm thinking, my goodness, do, does it not register that my call is coming from Bath? So if that's been happening in recent years, it's only going to get worse. I'm sorry, but I don't think a one-stop shop police presence is good enough for this city. And we do need to have police presence. I'm glad to see the audience warming up. Okay, um, a question from Ozzy Field, uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a minute each for this one. And I'm going to insist from the chair that you begin your answer yes or no, uh, and then you can give us a sentence of justification. Okay? <laughs> You've got a minute. You can get two or three sentences in. You're welcome to do it. Okay? We're on a minute. And the, the question is the bedroom tax. If you were elected as MP for Bath, would you, and there was a, there was a vote on this issue, would you vote to repeal it, yes or no? And... Uh, we're in with, uh, with Julian, Deverell and, and UKIP. Yes, it's in the UKIP manifesto that we would get rid of the bedroom tax. Um, it clearly is not a fair tax and it's not been implemented in a way that brings about fairness. We've seen, you know, as it's gone on and on, we've just seen more and more examples of um, iniquitous um, decisions being made and, and you know, people being turfed out of homes, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, what can I say? It's... Um, it's in the manifesto. We'd get rid of it. Thank you. <laughs> Lorraine. Thank you very much. Yes, I would repeal it. It's caused huge problems for many people, and particularly disabled people. Disabled people who need that second bedroom for a carer. Infirm people, elderly people who need the second bedroom. And, and they've been caught up in all of this. It's just not fair. I would hope and I would like to hand over to the people out there that they would be fair themselves. That if they had a property, um, and I can give an example, obviously I'm fourth generation in the city of Bath, that my grandparents lived at Newton Road, but they had a two bedroom uh, house and they moved into one bedroom so that they could give up their home in Newton Road for a family. So I would like to give that back give the opportunity back to people out there. You see people go onto the lists and they do try to do flats and house shares. So for the people who need the second bedroom for carers, they should not be in this situation. Thank you. Steve Bradley, please. Steve. Uh, thank you, Chair. One word, yes. Um, I think there is a need to ensure the best use of, of, of the, the publicly owned housing resources. We do have a huge number of people na on waiting lists nationwide. Um, if we're honest, the quickest and easiest way to deal with a part of that is to ensure that in a small number of cases where you have one person, say, living in a three-bed property, that there are appropriate measures to ensure that we can get those more, more fairly. 
but it has to be done in a correct and fair way. And forcing people to pay a tax because they weren't trading down to smaller properties, where those smaller properties simply do not exist, in my view, is moral and it shouldn't happen. Finally, we've had one and a half million social housing units removed under previous Labour and Conservative governments. This current government is the only one in decades where social housing has gone up. You can probably work out what, Sorry, Chair. what the difference is in terms of the parties in there. But this new policy that the Conservatives suddenly announced of giving right to buy for housing association properties would be an absolute disaster in Bath. 100% of our social housing in Bath is, is, is in the housing association sector. It would be a disaster for the city. Thank you. Let's come to Ben Howlett and the Conservatives. We've got a problem with the microphone on this side. Have we got a replacement, please? Uh, swap mics. So you just use the one for now. We'll try. If it cuts out in the right places, it might be quite good for us. I don't know. I promise, I promise you. Did I say yes or no to that question? I don't know. I'm sorry. Am I still there? No, I, everything no can, can you all hear me? There we go. Is that good? Marvellous, marvellous. Well, I, I'm sure I might have said yes to that. I'm sorry. Um, the, the answer to this is no. I know I'm not going to be very popular in saying that, but, uh, well, I know, um, in all honesty with you. However, we do have a situation in that we haven't, for a very long period of time, built enough social housing in this uh, country. And faced with some very difficult decisions, the uh, Conservatives and the Liberal Democrat Coalition ended up coming up with a decision to uh, say to those people who are living, in some instances, I've known them, uh, they live in Bath, uh, there are people who are five or six to a two-bedroom flat, um, and they are having to subsidise, uh, because it's not a tax, by the way, just as an economist, it's reduction in a subsidy, that isn't a tax. As an economist, that is absolutely truth, which uh, I really find rather annoying. Um, and what we've ended up having is a situation where those families are having to subsidise people who are living in um, social rented accommodation for them to live one person to a four bedroom uh, flat. So in some very difficult times, we had to make some very difficult decisions. And now, hopefully, we'll be able to see those families be able to get themselves into uh, a better accommodation. Uh, long term, we need to build more of social housing. With great struggles, we're going to... Dominic. I do encourage feedback, but not from the same person all the time. And if others of you want to chip in, make a contribution, but don't expect a response from the stage. Um, your minute starts now, <laughs> Thank you. Dominic. Um, yes, obviously, we were, uh, I would uh, repeal the bedroom taxes in our manifesto. Um, I think it's uh, just an indication of uh, a whole raft of policies that were, and, and laws uh, introduced by this government which are absolutely not based on evidence whatsoever. I mean, to bring this in when there are no smaller houses for these people to go to was just bizarre. Um, it, it's, it's a nice soundbite for, for the lots, of, lots of their supporters who seem to demonise people on, on social security as some sort of you know, work-shy scroungers, which is a nice narrative for the Conservatives, but absolutely not based on truth at all. Um, you know, I, 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 I hesitate to give them any credit for building any social housing because what else are they going to do? You know, so many people crammed into so few houses, which the right to buy is abhorrent. I mean, you know, I, you know, it's social housing sold at a, you know, we discount the price that buy to let landlords pay to buy these houses and then let them back to, you know, us taxpayers to pay housing benefit to. Absolutely ridiculous. It's a crazy system. We'd scrap right to buy, build half a million council houses, scrap the bedroom tax, bring some fairness back. And Ollie Middleton, please. Yes, absolutely. It will be one of the first things we will do when we get into government. I mean, Steve, I mean, your level of hypocrisy is just astounding. Um, your party has supported the bedroom tax on every single occasion. In fact, you only voted for it. Two months ago, it affects over 60,000 carers, affects the disabled, and the fact is these people are being asked to move into homes that simply do not exist. It is a cruel and callous policy and is a symptom of a deeply unequal country. Um, the fact is this policy was implemented at a time when millionaires were getting tax breaks. Um, 
we will most definitely repeal it. Um, the fact is this current government simply only stands um, for a few at the top and the bedroom tax is a symbol of that. Yeah, let's, I'm going to allow two people to come back me and Steve. Um, in 30 seconds. Hypocrisy. I think it was the Labour Party who actually trialled the bedroom tax. I think it was actually their idea when they were still in government. Um, no, it is true. I believe it is. Um, and uh, it was, it was trialled in a part of the country under a Labour government. Very briefly, firstly, I'm, I make no qualms for being very clear where I disagree with my party. I'm not a machine. Ollie may toe the party line. I don't. I suspect Ollie didn't support the Iraq war. But that doesn't make, that doesn't, I'm not going to accuse him of hypocrisy because his party did. I don't support the bedroom tax in its current form. I want it resolved. And finally, this is part of a broader narrative we see at every hostings of collective amnesia from Labour. We hear about zero-hour contracts. There's 70 Labour MPs of zero-hour contract staff, including four uh, in Ed Miliband, uh, sorry, Ned Balls' team, on tuition fees. Rightly, the Labour Democrats get a hard time over that. It was Labour that broke four promises on tuition fees, including trebling the fees themselves in 2004. So we need some honesty and less sound bites. You didn't support the Iraq war. I don't support the bedroom tax. At which point we will call a halt to this particular question. Uh, we've finally become extremely controversial. Uh, we may become even more controversial now. Um, I, I, I should just say, having gone through that question, despite the tremendous response from, from, from you in the audience, that none of these guys on the stage, I don't think, are going to make politicians. And you know why? They all said yes or no when I asked them to. <laughs> on which point I will move on. Uh, we, we've had a number of questions uh, to do with matters of, around education. So this is, this is um, a question that specifically refers to Bath, and I hope you can actually sort of help us with that. But we, we, the question is, what do you want to do? We've attempted to summarise one or two questions. What do you want to do, or what would you want to do, uh, what would you want to encourage your party to do to improve secondary schools in Bath? Okay, what would you want to do, what would you want to encourage your party to do to improve secondary schools in Bath? And we're going to begin um, on my left with Dominic, please. Um, firstly, we have to recognise that actually in Bath, I mean, this government likes to talk about choice. There is no longer a choice for an LEA maintained... Sorry, I'm going to... We're back to two minutes for this particular oh, question. Okay. okay, sorry, start again, Dominic. <laughs> that, that's fine. Um, there is no LEA school anymore in Bath. They're all academies or free schools at the secondary level. Um, I don't think that's right. The party doesn't think that's right. We think anything that receives state money should actually be democratically accountable. Uh, so we would bring those back under local authority control, which would also mean, of course, that the pupils would get decent meals and all those other things, which actually academies and free schools don't have to get for whatever reason. Um, what, another thing we want to do is, actually, education is far too focused now on league tables and testing and, and you know, making children feel that they've kind of failed at an early age if they don't do well. Lots of children don't actually blossom academically until a bit later on, so we'd get rid of things like SATs and league tables, because actually what you really need to do for a decent education system is, is cater it for the child, not for some... You know, if the teacher is concerned that they will lose pay because of performance-related pay, which is another thing we'd abolish for teachers, because it's ridiculous. Um, you know, if, 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 a pay, if a teacher knows that they will lose money if they take the time they need to take with a certain child who's struggling, and of course, I mean, um, they're even best will in the world, if they're the most patient, they have mortgages and families they've got to pay for. It's completely wrong to incentivize teachers with you know reducing their pay so let's make sure that the kids who need the help get the help let's make sure that your local school is a good school let's get rid of this nonsense of free schools that are allowed to opt out of all sorts of certain things i mean it's nobody really knows what their local school does anymore who runs it and who's making a profit from it let's get rid of all that stuff leas teachers getting decent pensions which we'd restore get rid of performance related pay make sure all kids can walk or cycle to school so we don't have to drive them everywhere and actually let's make education about rounding the person and making you a prop you know m making you feel like your life is interesting and, and you know that you are an interesting person not just a cog in a machine where you're being put into a, some company which will then complain to you you can't do their particular thing which you haven't been trained for it's not about training you for a job it's about actually making you a human We go to the end of the other table and I invite Steve Bradley to offer a perspective, please. 
Uh, thank you, Ward. I mean, three main things I would say to improve education in schools in Bath. Firstly, secure the funding. In the current government, the Liberal Democrats secured ring fencing for schools funding uh, from all the other cuts which have happened. Uh, we want to go even further if we're in any future government. We have a commitment to cradle to college education from nursery to 19. Um, and why that's so key is, secondly, I believe in evidence-based policy making. Um, and especially when it comes to priorities on school spending. There's very clear evidence that by about the age of seven, if a young person is falling behind on reading and arithmetic, they are extremely unlikely to ever catch up again with their peers. So that's why as a party, we put a huge emphasis upon early years learning and a couple of key ways we've done that in government and we want to do even more of in future. Firstly, we brought it, bought in something called the pupil premium, you may have heard of. It's basically a dedicated pot of money that goes to, uh, that helps disadvantaged, sorry, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds and it goes to their schools specifically to provide extra support for them. For too long in this country, we've had a gulf in attainment levels between people from relatively well-off backgrounds and relatively poor backgrounds, and it just has been stubbornly wide. What we found that pupil premiums providing extra support and money, and only three years after it's begun, we've already started to see the attainment level between wealthy and less wealthy young people starting to close. It is working. And also evidence-based free school meals. We've brought in free school meals for infant children. It's a hot, healthy meal. Again, there's evidence that it helps their concentration and attainment levels. Uh, we want to expand that to all, um, all children at primary school. And finally, I think it's absolutely key that we maintain diversity in our education sector. And I guess in terms of this audience, I would refer to faith schools. Faith schools played a key role. Once, pretty much the first schools in this country were faith schools. And we need to recognize the role that faith schools continue to play in providing quality education. They're very often more diverse than state schools, more popular and more successful. So our sector needs choice like that for parents and for pupils. Thank you. You, Kip and Julian, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I went to school in Bath, obviously I grew up here from a very young age, and um, I essentially had, uh, there was essentially two options that became one option that were open to me, um, I either was going to go to a state comprehensive, um, or if my parents were wealthy enough, I was going to go to one of Bath's absolutely fantastic fee-paying schools, and unfortunately it was the former um, of those, and um, I was the square peg that didn't fit into the round hole of standardised state education. And so I've been quite inspired by UKIP's education policy. We acknowledge that people and children are individuals and that people will have different needs and, uh, and different ways of learning. So we advocate a much more diverse range of schools. The state comprehensive will obviously have its place, but we'll introduce more grammar schools, more free schools, more schools that specialise in, um, in certain, certain subject areas. We've got a great example of that in Bath. You know, we, as candidates, have been up to the studio school in Coombe Down, which is one of these kinds of initiatives. And um, it's an inspiring place to go and speak to the children there. It's a very, very successful, very successful project. Um, within the state sector, you obviously need to look at this culture that they have of, of excessive sort of league tables and testing and tick box targeting and paperwork. We'd get rid of an awful lot of that so that teachers could could concentrate on teaching and developing the lives of, um, of the children that are there. So there's obviously an awful lot of things that need to be done. Um, let's make the best of our young people. You know, let's give them an opportunity, irrespective of what their aptitude is. Everybody should have a good platform from which they can succeed, whether that's going to make them you know, a, a physicist or a carpenter. They, each, each of those two people are going to need different avenues to be able to get there. So let's provide that for them. And Ben Howlett, please. Well, I'm really pleased to hear that um, Julian thinks the uh, Bath Studio School is an amazing school because I'm a school governor at that school and it is one of the best schools uh, that Bath has. And we have an amazing set of schools in this city. I mean, if I was lucky enough uh, to have actually grown, grown up here, I grew up in um, North East Essex originally, and the uh, comprehensive schools there were, to be honest with you, not exactly the best out there. And I would have itched to have had the range of uh, schools that were available uh, to me uh, 
that we've got here now. And for a long time, I've believed in uh, the diversification of uh, the education system because, to be frank, not everybody wants to go down the academic path in their lives. People want to go off and uh, maybe get an apprenticeship. Maybe they want to go off into further education. And the great thing about the studio school is that if you wanted to become an app developer or you wanted to become a TV producer, then they've got facilities available to them which are second to none. And the passion that those kids have got about their education, their future chances, are absolutely absolutely superb. The other thing I want to say is really around uh, fighting for the funding for our secondary schools in Bath as well. I was at St Greg's the other day, um, they're looking for 1.5 million in order to develop the second stage of their sixth form centre. Uh, my job, if I do become the MP, is to be sitting behind the Secretary of State for Education, whoever that might be, to lobby them to spend more money in Bath. Uh, I know the question's on secondary education, but obviously we do have a big crisis in the immediate uh, next few years in relation to the number of primary school places as well, and it's in our manifesto to get three new primary schools built in Bath too. But I just want to say one last thing in relation to special needs education. It's one of the reasons I got involved in politics. Special needs education often gets forgotten about in our uh, education system. We've got an amazing school at Three Ways. Uh, the last Labour government introduced mainstreaming. The council which I campaigned against was a Conservative council. Uh, when they were closing down a special needs school, I will do everything I can in order to support our special needs education in this city and uh, champion their cause. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Ollie Middleton Labour, please. Yeah, well, I mentioned in my opening statement um, that we want to ensure that each generation does better than the last. The major part of that is education. We've said that we won't just ring fence the education budget. We will guarantee that it actually rises in line with inflation. We've also said we'll cap class sizes at 30 kids. Um, but like Dominic, we have said that we will put an end to free schools. Um, there are two problems with free schools. One, the lack of accountability. Two, the fact that consistently we've seen money pumped into these ideological vanity projects in areas when they are not needed at the expense of other local schools. We'll put an end to that. Um, I also think we need to generally put an end to the fragmentation and marketization of education, which is something we've seen over the past um, five years. I was at a meeting um, with teachers from the NUT the other day, the level of pressure that teachers are on is just amazing. Um, it's absolutely astounding. Um, we need to learn how to value our teachers again, and we also need to revalue um, education and ask exactly what education is for. I think we need to be equipping all kids um, with the knowledge and the skills to succeed in life, um, and irregardless of their background or where they come from. Lorraine Morgan Bringhurst. Thank you very much. Um, I was very proud to go to school in Bath, as I know my grown up children were, and it was great to hear Ben talking about St. Gregory's School, which was a fantastic senior school that my children attended and gave them a great start in, in life. Um, previously, the council's always spent about 45% 45, 45 of its budget on education, but we still know that there's not enough investment into education. Less bureaucracy for the teachers. We see the stress that teachers are under. This has got to stop. It's almost like in the NHS as well, where doctors, uh, uh, and, and we see this with teachers, almost on a weekly basis, the government give them another policy, another policy, another policy. They came into teaching as a vocation to teach children not to be caught up in all the bureaucracy that previous governments have given to them. And um, there should be less pressure on the children within the exam structure. I recall my school days where we also had fantastic lessons with, with cookery and we did a lot more sport, but there's so much pressure on, as you mentioned, on SATs and, and exams, which are important because we need to, to, the children need to be educated to a standard to enable them to move forward. They are our future, but they need to have more choice. They need to, we need to be preparing them in the schools for the future 
future. Um, I run a business and I encourage um, students to get in touch to do work experience. They need more of that. They need more of that to enable them to move forward in the future. I was involved with a project called Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow, fantastic project that was held at St. Gregory's School a few years ago. And businesses came in to to the senior school and, and the, the young people had the opportunity to find out about what businesses were out there, what skills, not just about what they could read, meeting the people out there who are in those careers. So a lot more of that needs to go back into schools because we've lost so much because they're under so much pressure with the exams and all that structure. Thank you. You, I, I'm going to allow everybody the chance of one comeback, so you haven't had a comeback, but I'm going to rule out against Neil because you've had one comeback and time is running on. Okay, it's just very good, very, very quick point. Oh, how long? Mine won't be that 30 long. seconds by I way of comeback. I might be able to do it in 20 seconds for you as well. You've lost 10 already, boy, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sound like teacher here, but Ollie, would you stop calling free schools? Because the Bath Studio School is a free school, an ideological vanity project, because you're really hurtful to those people that are transforming lives up at that school. They're doing amazing work up there. Every time you keep saying it over and over again, it's really hurtful, so stop it, all right? That's bad rhetoric on your part. It's a matter of opinion. A matter of opinion, it's completely subjective. The reason I've called them ideological vanity projects, I stress the word ideology, because it's about shrinking the role of the state right across the board. This is, in this particular example, it's about shrinking the role of the state in the context of education. And I think, and the Labour Party thinks, that's extremely damaging. You... I... <clears throat> No. You, you hear the views, you make your decisions, you cast your votes. No, um, I, I'm going to move on. Um, I, I have a statement from the Chief Inspector with responsibility for Bath. One of our stewards has been in touch and has obtained uh, a response for him which says, uh, he has confirmed that the police presence in Bath is not being withdrawn, just relocated. Um, I, I simply share with you uh, what has come from on high? Um, I want to move on. Uh, I want to move on because we've, got, we've had a number of questions which we've tried to put together into one simple, straightforward question. Um, we, well, I hope it is. Um, is the current benefit system fair? And what change, what one particular change would you like to see introduced to it? Were you in government? Is the current benefit system fair? And what one change would you like to see introduced uh, to it? And uh, we're going to go, we're going to start with Steve Bradley uh, and a Liberal Democrat view. And we're on two minutes. Gosh, doesn't give me very much time to, to gather my thoughts. Um, is the current system fair? Um, if we start with the context, I think most people uh, you may or may not agree, most people would agree that under the Labour government um, the benefit system got out of control in some ways. Um, it's a statement of, of fact that um, it paid people, some people, a small number of people, more to be on benefits than to be in work. Um, now, I don't think that's, I don't think, if I can finish please, sir, I don't think that's uh, set up for the small number of people who find themselves in that situation inspires any form of dignity at all. I'm human, you're human. If I can ha get more money in one particular way than in another way, then chances are you'll take it. Now, I do believe most people want to work, and that's why I think it's important, therefore, to make sure that, that work is available for people, and we've been involved in helping to create uh, over two million new jobs. But there's still a problem with some of our welfare system, I believe. I, I think, I'll give you my personal view. Um, you can make your own judgment on what the Liberal Democrats have done in government, but I am here to tell you what my view is as somebody who hopes to be the MP for Bath, and it's a view that I will maintain moving forward. I do wonder whether things have gone too far in the other direction. So we've, re we've removed the, the idea of, of wel welfare going beyond being a safety net because it's absolutely vital we have that public safety net for people when they fall in hard times, often through absolutely no fault of their own, through their employment disappearing or through being, being ill. But as I said, we have to make sure 
that we don't have a situation whereby people are trapped in benefits because it's just not in their interests financially or in any other way to leave there. Um, and as we alluded to earlier on with the bedroom tax, and I'll say it again, I don't support the bedroom tax in its current form. I think it's unfair, especially to penalise people for not moving to properties that don't exist. Uh, as I invite um, Ben Howlett to be ready to speak, I would just say this is going to be our last major question, um, uh, and uh, uh, we shall move to summing up after we've completed this round. So, Ben, uh, over to you. Benefits tax system, the benefit system, is it fair, and what changes would you like to see introduced? What one change? Yes, I mean, putting this into context, uh, when I left university, it was 2008 and the uh, recession was on, and uh, I grew up in a household where my mother's disabled, and seeing what she had to go through for 20 years, to be frank, is um, pretty astonishing. I mean, ha hats off to her for being able to get through the system. Um, it is a messy, messy bureaucratic system, and she's had to go through two work capability assessments herself, and that has been challenging. But as I said, when I left university, I ended up um, going into my first job stuck on minimum wage for about 18 months and I was paying um, pretty high levels of tax because we hadn't reformed the system by that stage and the next door neighbour, she could work but she was living a life on benefits whereas my mum wasn't getting the support that she needed, whereas the person living next to me could have gone out to work but didn't and I just found that absolutely absurd that something which I believe in heavily which is the, the the work ethic, that Christian sort of belief of getting people into work, uh, that's something that I, is a fundamental principle to myself, wasn't being uh, created within the welfare system. So the work that Ian Duncan Smith has done over the last five years, yes, has its critics, but it's turned around people's lives, I'm afraid to say, that uh, more people now are in work. The benefit claimant count has massively fallen in this country. Um, it's for the first time ever in our history, it's better to be in work than out of work on benefits. Not to say that the whole job has been done. I will do everything I can in order to protect the most vulnerable people in society. I want more money being given to people like my mum who need the support, uh, but for those people that can get into work, I think it's really important we do help more people into work. And that 1.9 million more people in uh, the security of a job isn't just about getting them a job, it's about turning around people's lives. And that is really what our uh, aim is as, uh, as a government. Ollie Middleton straining at the leash and he's next on to go anyway. Well, I believe the welfare state is part of the fabric of any decent and humane society. Um, we will get the welfare bill down, but we won't do it by making cuts at the expense of the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. Instead, we'll actually tackle the underlying issue, which is low pay. Um, and we'll put an end to a lot of the language used by this government, which quite frankly I think is disgraceful. George Osborne talks about strivers and scroungers. Well, 60% of welfare recipients are actually in work, but cannot earn enough to sustain themselves. For the first time ever, we have more people living below the poverty line who are actually in work than out of it. We will change that by tackling low pay and in turn tackling inequality and poverty. And on your left, Lorraine, Morgan Binghurst, much. please. Oh, thank you. Well, the, what, the question was, what, what, what would I change? What would I want to introduce? And I definitely believe we should review the support to disabled people. I have so many residents in my ward who are genuinely poorly and disabled, who over the last few years since the coalition government um, uh, changed the assessments, they have been so concerned, so stressed, and they, the, we, need to re, we need to review that and go back to being fair to people who are having assessments and are and I have really got really disabilities and are unable to work and then for people um, out there who are working who still use food banks as I mentioned in my opening statement you know 50% of people in this country using food banks are working we need to increase the minimum wage we need to ensure that the lowest paid are paid fairly 
And then there would be a lot less people needing top-up from the welfare system. So those are two areas that I'm really, really passionate that the next government needs to address. Julian, please. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, benefit claimants sometimes get stereotyped quite nastily on television, don't they, with um, silly programs like Benefit Street and things like that. And um, obviously not everything you see on the television is true, and uh, <clears throat> I certainly know what stereotyping sometimes feels like. Um, but... Um, Are you an immigrant, Julian? <laughs> Actually, Steve, no. Um, I think it's I think it's very important that as a as a compassionate society, we spoke about those Christian values earlier, didn't we? Um, that we do have a safety net for people. Um, that safety net should not become a lifestyle choice. Um, so, you know, as, uh, in, in our UKIP manifesto, we're committed to maintaining a you know a sensible um, welfare policy. Um, if you take the food banks as an example. Um, the fact that we're having to use them is a disgrace. And we would invest some money in food banks. We would install um, some advisors in there that are going to help, um, you know, help to offer people advice as to how they can, how they can um, improve things. The ATOS assessments for disabled people, the benefits they get, we'd scrap those and go back to the old system um, of uh, getting GPs to do the assessments. And um, some of the things that have been said about people who are actually working full-time but are still suffering poverty and still um, in receipt of in-work benefits. And we're committed to taking the lowest paid in this country out of tax altogether because we have this ridiculous system whereby they pay tax, the government then gives some of, them back, some of the money back to them in the form of benefits, which is obviously a very expensive and admin-heavy way of doing so. Um, so there's an awful lot of ways that we can start to deal with this problem. And you know, our, you know, our fully costed, fully verified manifesto lays out many ways in which we can tackle this and start to sort it out. Thank you. Dominic. Um, straight answer, no, of course it's not fair. Um, I actually object to the word welfare. I think it's social security, we all pay into it through our lives. Um, we all, any of us could hit hard times at any point, we can be made redundant and actually depend on this, these payments which we deserve and which we paid into. Um, we shouldn't feel ashamed for claiming them. This government Make, is trying to make people feel ashamed for cla claiming the benefits they're entitled to. And that's the one thing I would change is that whole sort of dialogue of, oh, strives and shirkers, as has been mentioned. It's outrageous that, that they get away with it. Um, obviously, it's broken because we've got a million people going to food banks. I mean, clearly, it's not fair because they can't afford food. That's obvious. Um, just ask Ben and Steve, um, you know, how many people their government has working at HMRC chasing the far bigger problem of tax avoidance compared to the number of people at the DWP chasing the social bogeyman of benefits claimants, which actually is a very small cost. Fraudulent benefit claimants is such a small amount compared to what we don't claim from these rich multinationals. Um, people in jobs, how, I could go on. <laughs> you will have a chance to go on in a moment, Dominic, because you'll begin the final round for us. Um, uh, we now come to that point uh, in our gathering when each of the candidates in turn is going to make a one minute statement, uh, their summary as they wish to make it, um, uh, their appeal as they wish to make it, whatever, it's their minute uh, and we will listen um, with intense fascination, I'm sure. We'll start on the left and we work round to the right as I look at it and it's the other way for you. Thank you, Dominic. Okay, as I mentioned at the start, we have a really uh, interesting election coming up where you've got a very genuine choice between four parties that to, all, to some extent all are committed to austerity and cutting the amount of money we spend on the poorest. And you've got the Green Party that actually doesn't believe in that, that believes the poorest are actually paying for the mistakes of the richest. And we, we're not afraid to say we will put taxes up for the people who can afford, those ta who can afford it because it's, that's what society is about. So you've got to ask yourself... Do you want a party or a government that is chasing this, um, you know, all about the deficit, all about money, and actually ignoring compassion and what's happening to our fellow man? Because really, that's the issue. That's the choice you've got. There are people who can't afford to eat. There are people who are in cold houses, who are dying of the cold in the sixth richest country in the world. And, and, and we are actually talking about doing something about that. It's not all about the money, men. 
It's not all about how rich the richest in society can get, and they are getting richer. When you look at GW, you know, uh, the gross national product, it's for the rich, it's not for the poor. I'm going over to Lorraine, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the mood of the country is changing, and I think this general election is showing that, and people are not prepared to be ignored by Westminster anymore. Your MP is your representative, the person who acts on your behalf in Westminster, and I believe as the independent candidate, without a party telling me what to do, that I can be a true voice for the city of Bath. And after my years of experience of living in this city, working in this city, being in local government, and my national committee experience, that I truly can go to Westminster and I can be your voice and I can represent you truly with integrity, dignity, and be a true voice for this city, our wonderful city of Bath, our wonderful residents, businesses, and organizations. Thank you. Holly, thank you. The voters of Bath have a choice on the 7th of May. The Tories and the Liberal Democrats, despite anything they may have said tonight, have worked together over the past five years to make extreme ideological cuts at the expense of the poorest and most vulnerable, resulting in an increase in inequality across the UK and in Bath. In 2010, many of you voted to keep the Tories out. You ended up with an MP who voted for the bedroom tax, an expensive top-down reorganisation the NHS, and for the gagging bill. This time, I am urging you to vote with your heart as well as your head. Labour believes in prosperity over extreme austerity and in inspiring hope rather than fear. If everyone who believed in Labour voted Labour, you would have a Labour MP. On the 7th of May, you have a chance to reduce inequality, to save the welfare state, save the NHS. So, vote for a change, vote Labour. Ben, please. Bath faces a once-in-a-generation opportunity for change on May the 7th in a couple of days' time. And we've had a very long-serving, excellent MP in Don Foster. And yes, they are going to be big shoes to fill. And he's been a great advocate for this city. And I hope, if I'm lucky enough to become your MP, I will be equally as strong as an advocate for this city. But for too long, we've had uh, a lot of the major issues here uh, unresolved. And we need to make sure we resolve those. So I've set out clearly my six-point plan, which uh, you'll see coming through your letterboxes. I know, don't worry, it'll be a couple of days' time and uh, you'll end up with a lot less literature coming through your drawers, I promise. But you'll see that, uh, that we want to tackle our stalling transport system. We don't have enough affordable homes. Families like mine can't afford to get on the property ladder at the moment. And also we lack our desperately needed primary school places as well. We've set out a clear deliverable plan that I want you to hold me to account to, so that if I am lucky enough to become your MP in five years time you can say you can you can say whether or not I've delivered those so thank you very much Julian well thank you very much and uh, obviously thank you to all of you for coming out and listening uh, this evening I'm glad not too many people disappeared out the back during the event um, we're sat here in the run-up to probably what is the most interesting general election for a very 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 long time and the political establishment that have used the first-past-the-post voting system to maintain their position for a long time are starting to crumble. And we've now reached that phase of the campaign where nationally and locally, in most of the seats around the country, you're being told, and you're probably just about to be told, that you've got two choices. But this time, you don't have two choices. There's a lot of other choice on the menu. And I'm not going to stand here uh, or sit here and tell you who you should vote for. Um, because obviously that would be obvious, wouldn't it? Um, what I'm going to urge all of you to do is go out and vote for what you really want. You know, read manifestos, don't vote tactically. It's time that this system was broken. The whole vote for me or you'll get him mentality is old news. Steve, please. Thank you, Warden. Thank you for your time this evening. Hopefully, uh, the debate's given you a flavour of what the Liberal Democrats and Booth I stand for, a party whose core values of freedom, fairness, equality, charity, and respect for our planet, I believe, reflect true Christian values. Um, most importantly of all, I hope it's given you a chance to think about the future direction you want Bath and Britain to take 
after the election. On the council, the Lib Dems are the only party that has consistently worked closely with and empowered faith-based organisations in Bath, like the Genesis Trust, and nationally, with another coalition looking certain, the real question isn't who will be Prime Minister, but who will they need to depend on to form a government, and what will the price be in return? Will it be a right-wing Conservative UKIP coalition, ideologically cutting Britain's public services to the bone? Chair. Or not? Chair, sorry, sorry, that's not a minute. I give him five seconds more. He's got his own timer. I'm, I'm sorry, that, that was 41 seconds on my timer. I've got my own timer. Yes, I'm sorry. I did feel short. I did feel short. It's only on one minute five now, and we've been talking for over 20 seconds. You have 15 seconds. more seconds. Uh, 20, chair, to be fair. Um, or will it be a left wing SNP coalition which borrows more than Britain can afford and crashes our economy yet again? Or finally, please Chair, will it be a coalition involving the Lib Dems who've shown that we can govern responsibly and take difficult decisions when required, anchoring Britain in the middle ground? So if you want to ensure Britain has a moderate, progressive government anchored in the centre ground, where I believe most Christians want it to be, please vote for Steve I Bradley think that's two and the Lib Dem Council. Now. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We are, are we not in this country, privileged to be able to vote and vote freely and uh, uh, to hold a gathering like this tonight? Uh, and as an, as an event organised by a Christian group, uh, I invite you to, to be truly thankful for that. Um, your new MP is before you even now, even though we didn't know it. Um, <laughs> But I, I, hope this, <laughs> I hope this evening has been helpful to you to confirm the vote that you want to cast or to help you if you've been uncertain. That's the whole point of the evening and, and particularly from a Christian perspective to hear uh, some reflections which, which help those of you who feel that's important in casting your vote. Um, I understand that this little group uh, is something like a traveling circus and they've done 20 odd of these um, these events so i want to say a very special word to them not just for being prepared to to put their heads above the parapet and stand for the parties that they stand for but also for coming along tonight and sharing with us in the open and honest way that they have so can we show our appreciation thank you very much Um, I do just want to say as well, thank you to those of you who did put questions in. Uh, if your question didn't get read out, um, we had something like 50 questions. Um, we've managed seven. And I hope we've dealt with them uh, in such a way that you feel you've got a response that was helpful on the questions we've asked. And we've tried to have as broad a spectrum uh, as we could from, from what we received. So um, uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, my executive secretary will have the final word. <laughs> thank you very much. It's just uh, a number of thank yous. First of all, to Bath City Church for allowing us to, to use this fantastic auditorium and for all the support that they've given to the event. Uh, a thank you from me in particular for the people who have acted as stewards tonight and to make sure it's run smoothly. A demonstration of their ability, of course, was that one steward decided to ring the police and find out the truth about police stations. I was, I was, I was ready to give the answer to that one, but uh, it's done done for me. Thank you. What I really want to tell you about now is the fact that we've recorded, video recorded the whole event tonight, and unless somebody seriously objects, and I hope you won't, it will be within the next 24 hours available on YouTube. There is an organisation called Democratic Accountability. Um, that uh, has the task of uh, listening and recording to what politicians are saying or the candidates are saying, and then after the event, when they're elected and are in office, putting the question to them again to see if they've been true to what they've stated tonight. And it's an important task. Accountability in all walks of life is vitally important, no less than if you're a parliamentarian. So I hope that uh, you will agree to that. Um, and uh, as I say, it should be, um, if you Google something like democratic accountability, you'll find your way into it. Um, uh, I can assure you that none of the audience has been filmed, only the platform. Um, and finally, 
Yes, it is. Sorry, you're right. Yes, democratic account. Yes, to get to this one. Yes, exactly. So it's a website. Anyway, you'll find it. Um, and uh, two final things. One is the seventh candidate, uh, the English Democrats, uh, Jenny Knight, the candidate, uh, they were all invited, and Jenny was invited as well, but is not here, just to make sure you're clear about that. And then finally, my thanks to Ward Jones for um, being our chair tonight, and I hope you will show your appreciation for him. Uh, good night and God bless. Travel carefully. <laughs>